Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 170. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. Well, this week, our guest is Lee Carney. Lee is one of the nation's most active and successful single-family real estate investors, having flipped over 7,000 houses in the last decade, totaling over $500 million in property under his Spin Real Estate Company. Lee is known as the leading expert in understanding and leveraging real estate market cycles. He's been on the front lines of flipping homes, and his passion and expertise come into play as he inspires and educates real estate investors just like you. Without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. All right, today I welcome on the show, Lee Carney. Hey, Lee, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's our pleasure. Well, Lee, could you tell the audience members a little bit about yourself, how you got started in the world of real estate investing, and just kind of share your journey up to this point? Sure. Well, my name is Lee Carney. I own a business, Southeast Property Investments Network, which is what we currently operate under. We buy and sell nationwide. And as far as rewinding back to where I started, I grew up in Ireland. That's where I'm from. Lived there 17 years, then moved to the States. 2001, got my education, got my degree, got my master's, moved back to Ireland, bought a condo in 2002, flipped it right at the beginning of 2003 because I got broken into and I said, this is not for me. Where the <laughs> light bulb went off for me, I made $35,000 from that accidental flip. And that's when I got started in real estate. I had never planned on being a real estate investor until that happened. And in 2004, I moved to California. And one of the first things I did not even knowing this is what you're supposed to do. By asking a bunch of questions, which is what I would encourage everybody out there to do, there is no stupid question. There's no dumb question if you don't know. Because I didn't even know what a foreclosure was when I started out. I didn't really understand that fix and flip was a business. I, I hadn't really thought about that. I just viewed houses as something you bought, you lived in them, you sold them, and you were done with them. And so with that being said, asked a bunch of questions, found a guy I'd gone to church with at the time. His name was Craig. And he ended up teaching me how to flip houses. So I rode around with him. I helped him. Found a mentor, a guy I went to church with. I'm riding around with him. I'm helping him work on his properties, pick up materials. The whole time I'm asking questions. I'm learning, where do you buy? What do you buy? How much money did you put into these properties? What exactly do you fix up? What do you not fix up? Why? And so what he really taught me about, which is one of the first lessons I learned was curb appeal. He was really, really big on curb appeal because we were in Southern California at the time. You have all these dirt yards. And so one of the big things he did in all of his flips, he would make sure to put sod in a sprinkler system. And he'd do that early on in the flip. That means when he went to go sell it, you had bright green grass and it just stood out. Again, that might sound really elementary. Some people are laughing, but these are the things you don't know that because you just don't know. And so when you ask a bunch of questions, you figure out when you're flipping a house, it's different than living in a house. All you're trying to do when you really boil it down, and I think this is where a lot of people get this wrong, it's about putting the least amount of money into the house to get the most amount of profit. That's what a flipper is doing. But unfortunately, people watch HGTV and they want the most amount of money into the property to make it the prettiest house in the block. That's not the key to success there, is it? Exactly. Exactly. And so we're a business and I teach a lot of people this. And I said, you got to get back to what your core business is. Your core business is buying and selling real estate. You happen to rehab it as a function of that in order to get more profit, but it's still a business where it's the least amount of expenses, maximum amount of profit. So that's really helped hone my skills when I'm looking at flips, whether they make sense, how much money to put in. Ultimately, if you buy it at this price, 
and you can only sell at this price means there's a set amount of money you can put in where you, you're going to make a profit. You start putting in way more than that, you're either going to make no money or lose money. So anyway, going back to my history. So back 2004, found a mentor, told me to buy a probate. Again, I didn't know what a probate was. So yeah. I searched for four months, found this little old lady who was a real estate agent who worked for me. She goes, I have a probate for you, finally. Bought it. Cash, used some hard money, took down private financing to, to fund the majority of that. I had maybe 20, 30 grand to my name. And so I used the rest of the money as hard money borrowing. Moved into the house, which was crazy. I had a gang member on one side, a sheriff across the street, because it was a low-end neighborhood in San Bernardino, <laughs> California. So yeah. somehow I stumbled through the rehab, made every mistake under the sun. I got electrocuted, plumbing leaks, had an antenna follow me. Everything went wrong. Still made a profit. Put it on the market. He told me to do an open house. This is what my mentor told me. Mm -hmm. So I put out 50 signs. Now, this was crazy. Think about this. This is my first flip. I have no idea what I'm doing. I bought it for 130 And three months later, I'm putting a sign in the yard for 180 And I'm somehow hoping by the grace of God, I'm going to make some money. <laughs> so I put out all my open houses and I'm sitting there and lo and behold, 50 people come to my open house. So I'm like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So 50 people went through and this one guy, I remember his name, Jose Chalet. He comes up to me and he's a real personal guy, kind of in your face. He goes, I want to buy this house. I said, no problem. So fun fact, I get to the closing table with Jose and this is literally the day of closing. And by the way, he made a full price offer at that day, at that open house and ended up being the person who closed on it. But right at the closing table, he says, Lee, this is, I'll never forget this. He goes, are there ghosts in this property? So now I'm at this moral juncture in my life. Like this is my first real flip. I have no earthly idea if there's ghosts in here. So I looked Jose dead in the eye and I said, Jose, I have lived in this house for three months and it's 100% ghost free. He goes, I'll close. So I was like, woo. So anyway, uh, you, I've seen it all. Everything you can imagine in real estate. So closed that deal, parlayed that money, bought another flip in California. And that's when I made my second and third mistake. With my first one being moving into the house while rehabbing it. Uh -huh. My second house, moved back to Florida, ended up hiring a friend, bad mistake, tried to rehab it from Florida in California, third mistake, somehow stumbled through it. I think I made 10, 12 grand. Well, I was happy to get out the back. There you go. Okay. Way longer, went over budget, sold it for less, market was starting to turn. Little did I know it, that was the first crack in the armor in market cycles. So I'm thinking the world's never going to end. Three for three, I'm making money, I'm up hundred thousand bucks or something close to that, maybe eighty, ninety thousand dollars. Asked a bunch of questions in Tampa, Florida, found out one of my friend's fathers bought foreclosures. So I'm asking, what's a foreclosure? Where did they do foreclosure sales? He told me it was an option. So I go down to the courthouse steps, young and dumb, didn't know what I'm doing, realized I'm surrounded by sharks. That's one thing I picked up on. Everybody at the auction knew what was going on except for me. So I said, you know what? These people are really, really smart. So I'm going to act really dumb and try to figure out what's going on. So I always would dress down old clothes, torn clothes. I'll just sit in the back and look stupid. There's a whole bunch of case numbers being auctioned off. So I had no idea that these were houses and I didn't know how to figure that out. Finally, I found the lady. This lady was a godsend. She has a book that turns the numbers into addresses and she had a title search. I didn't even know what a title search was, but apparently some were good and some were bad. So I kind of got the cheat sheet from her about which ones I should buy, which ones I shouldn't buy. And that's how elementary, like this one good, this one bad. And so I would only bid on the ones that were good. So I would go to school in the morning, early afternoon, I would drive the properties. And then mid afternoon, I'd go to the auction. I started doing really good. So school dropped off. I would completely finished my master's there beginning 2005. So I just went gangbusters buying properties at the foreclosure auction. At the time, I bootstrapped hard money, credit cards. And lines of credit from Bank of America, every time I bought a house, they'd allow me to suck out a hundred grand. So I just turned that into a few million dollars in real estate, literally overnight. So now I'm a young 25 year old. I've made about 2 million bucks. I'm thinking the world is never going to end. My friends are, are looking for the special at Taco Bell and I've got a couple million bucks. So that was who I was surrounded with. I'm thinking this is never going to end. And it did. End of 2007, every house I sold was losing money. I found myself back at square one. And it was it was so quick that it happened. It's mind boggling. Literally, I was back to about 20 grand to my name from 2 million bucks in a two year span. So I'd made and lost about 2 million bucks. 
that was tough because I realized, man, there's people still making money and I'm losing my shirt. What am I doing wrong? And I realized back then there's always money in real estate, but you got to be on the right side of the deal. So I vowed after that point, I would always try to be on the right side of the deal and not just be set on one strategy, which was a fix and flip back then. So 2008, I flipped to being a wholesaler only, bought and sold everything before I even closed on it. And so I was collecting assignment fees and so, or double closing and collecting that arbitrage. Made right. almost a million bucks my first year back in real estate. And I haven't looked back. I've always paid attention to the market. I've always looked ahead as where the no next opportunity is. So not only the current market where it is today, where the market's going. I've moved my company 20 different times over the last 10 years, depending on where the opportunity is. About every six months, we're changing in focus because the opportunity is changing. So my team's been really good as far as moving with me and moving with the opportunities. And now we've been successful for a decade because we've, we've had that approach where we look at the market, we see where the opportunity is, and that's where we focus our efforts. Yeah, so much to unpack there, Lee, but, you know, kind of going back to your very- I'm kind of a lot, I know, I just- <laughs> No, it's good, it's do great. It. I don't have to ask so many questions like this, and I like it. But uh, going back to, you know, your very first condo in Ireland, being that accidental landlord, a story that so many people can relate to, that's how often people become real estate investors is through that accidental landlord. Lucky for you, it turned out great. You didn't lose the shirt off your back or anything of that nature. And then you realize, hey, I'm going to, you know, go out and learn from a mentor, just ask all these questions and just be a sponge and absorb this knowledge. So you do that for a few years, get a few flips under your belt, think, hey, world is always going up. And then until it doesn't, right, it comes crashing down. Yeah, lesson number one, markets don't always go up. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hard lesson there. So uh, you kind of go back, start from square one. Now you're kind of looking at the future, looking at market trends. What are some of these things you've learned to look out for? And what are some signals and what are some signs of good markets, bad markets? Walk us through, you know, what you look for when you're looking at new markets. Sure. Let's just take assembly or rental portfolio. That's something we talked about before the interview. When the market is euphoric about real estate, it's the wrong time to assemble a re rental portfolio. Because if there's heavy demand and prices have been going up for several years and are continuing to skyrocket, you're kind of at the tail end of that, which is where we are now in a lot of primary markets. I think that's the wrong time to assemble a, re a rental portfolio. Now, when everybody hates real estate and real estate prices are depressed and the only people buying are investors and the bank has an oversupply of properties, that's a great time. I mean, I have my own, my own case study. After losing all of that money in 2007 and starting to wholesale in 2008, I parlayed my profits into rentals and between 2008 and about 2014, possibly a little bit in 15, I assembled a rental portfolio that I'm now unloading now. In some cases, the properties that I purchased early on, I bought at twenty and $30,000 and I'm selling for 140, 150, 160, 170,000, even $200,000 for these rentals. So definitely, if you're trying to maximize your IRR, you want to buy at the bottom and sell at the top. Now, I know some people want to be landlords in perpetuity. I don't get that for me, but if you really want to maximize your profits with rentals, assembling a rental portfolio at the top of the market does not make sense. And what's going to happen? Your rent multipliers are much higher, which means your debt coverage service ratio is a lot lower. And also you're buying at the top, which means if there's a 20% shift in the market and you're 80% leveraged, you now have no equity. If you're 80% leveraged and the market goes down 30%, you're underwater. And so what that means in all reality, let's just suppose you locked yourself into five-year finance and now you're 10% upside down. You can't refi out of the property. This is a mistake a lot of investors make. They think that the sky is never going to fall. They think it's always the right time. You know, and I see this, I see stuff on social media, passive income, give me my rent. That's great. If you bought a rental at the right time in the market and you got plenty of equity, you've got plenty, your debt coverage service ratio is really high, which means you've got extreme ability to be able to pay back that debt. That absolutely makes sense. But if you're right in the line with a 1.2, like a true one point. 1.15, 1.2 debt covered service ratio. You get some vacancies, you get a large CapEx item on your property, or even if you got multifamily and you got that times 100, you could find yourself in big, big trouble. And so my caution to everybody out there, just because the bank will give you the money doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And I think a lot of people are mistaken thinking, well, if the bank wouldn't lend to me if it didn't make financial sense. They want to lend money. They make money. You've got brokers, you've got loan officers, you've got a 
lot of people making a lot of money when you borrow money. So that's their incentive, unfortunately. Even the realtor selling you the property, you know, you've got the loan officer making money. Everybody's making money. The insurance agent, when you take out the insurance, all these people want you to buy. But just because they want you to buy doesn't mean it makes sense to buy. So on rentals, I'm pretty clear about that. I think it's about timing. I see a lot of single family overheated in a lot of primary markets. I see multifamily overheated. I see people buying at the top and I see people taking out every dime that the bank will give them. And I think that, you know, you look at even the multifamily space, but all these new operators that have never done multifamily, they're, in fact, it's even crazier than that. They're bringing an equity piece for what the bank's not funding. So what you've got in some cases where people are not buying right, they're buying, they're stacking up 100% debt at full market value. You do bring up a good point there. And just to really quickly break down that debt service coverage ratio, that DSCR term you dropped a few times, what that is essentially is a ratio, a number indicating the ability for the property to pay back the debt. So in layman's terms, you could look at this like cash flow. If you have a $500 mortgage and a $1,000 rent, you've got enough money for the rent to cover the debt and then some, i.e. remainder is your cash flow. So if you're not investing for cash flow, you really are in some thin margins if that property turns or you're no longer able to bring in that, you know, say $1,000 a month rent, now you might be underwater on a monthly basis. So yeah, really important terms and metrics to keep in mind there when looking at these single family properties. Yeah, when you think about that, and I'm glad you said that, if you buy Let's just say we take real simple numbers. You buy a property that rents for $1,000 a month at $100,000 all in, or you buy it for $50,000 all in, your debt coverage service ratio is going to be way higher buying it at 50. It's basically virtually impossible for you to fail. You've got appreciation. You've got a huge ability. The delta between what your payment is and all in expenses versus your rent leaves a lot of room for screwing up. If you're all in 80%, yeah. by the way, this is what a lot of people are doing. They're stacking up rental properties where their payments all in or and that's before major capex by the way that's their pro forma payments are 800 bucks and they're yeah. collecting thousand bucks in fact let's take that exact example jacob you get one vacancy and you lose your rent for two months that's two thousand dollars in income if you're all in expenses regardless of it being rented or 800 bucks guess what it's going to take you 10 months to cash flow again on that property yeah, in fact you won't, you won't cash flow for almost a year and I see so many people doing this because they think it's the right thing to do. And they think that owning assets makes sense. In fact, it only makes sense is if you are actually cash flowing. Having a whole bunch of rentals that are costing you money every month makes no financial sense. And especially at the peak of the market where you've got no chance of appreciation in a lot of markets, or maybe minimal, you might have three or 5%, maybe, but there's also a decent chance if you're at the end of the market cycle, that asset, at least at some point in the near future, could be 20, 30, 40% less value than it is today. Yeah. Another thing, like you said, you can't count on the banks to protect your investment because they're in the business of lending money. Now, right. sure, they're not going to lend you $300,000 on a $100,000 property, at least in today's environment, maybe back in 2006, seven, eight, maybe that was a different story, but you can't rely on the bank to protect you as the investor. So yeah, another good point you bring up there. I try to caution people the way I teach people and mentor people in real estate. If this is your career and you're in for the long term, you got to think long term. You made a great point point about the bank. The bank's lending what the asset's worth today. They're not doing a five-year pro forma. Well, they might do it on an apartment building, by the way, because mm -hmm. that's very income-based. They do do that, but not on a single-family residence. They look at the appraisal today. They'll lend you X amount of dollars on what it's worth today. And that doesn't make business sense for a landlord who's going to be holding that asset for seven or 10 years. Yeah, definitely. So so what are some other metrics or maybe numbers you look for when maybe analyzing properties or looking at markets going back to the market trends? Sure. Well, I mean, I'm looking at historic pricing. And if you take a simple tool like Zillow, you look at the average pricing and let's just say our primary market Tampa, we have the average median price today in the low 200s. Back when the market peaked, it was mid 200s. And if you look at the bottom of the market, eight years ago, it was less than 100. So okay. if you see this, and then this again, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out you're back at peak pricing again. And even something simple as affordability, the average family can't afford an average house. The market's overheated. We're starting to see that in Tampa. People are really struggling because the payments have gone up with interest rates. 
something as simple as interest rates. Most people don't realize people were able to lock up a mortgage two years ago, three and a half percent or less. You get a mortgage today, 5%. That is what you're going to pay for a mortgage today. That means the same house is a lot less affordable and we're seeing it. We're seeing closings falling apart because buyers DTI is too high, debt to income. Mm -hmm. And they're just really riding the line. So I'm seeing a lot of signs in the market. Also, when you're getting your hair cut and your hairdresser, your barber is a house flipper, that's a problem. (laughs) The person bagging your groceries at Publix is a house flipper. I'm starting to see that stuff again. That tells me there's a problem. I'll give you something really simple too. You're going to RIA meetings. All of your local landlords are unloading their entire rental portfolios. Guess what? Why would a real estate investor be unloading their rental portfolio if the market was still going up or had a really good chance of really appreciating? They wouldn't. And so if you really look around what's happening in a lot of primary markets, things, if they haven't slowed down already, are going to slow down, there has to be a reset. Rates can't keep going up. Prices can't keep coming up. At some point, it doesn't make sense. That doesn't mean it's going to crash, but there does need to be a correction. Yeah, sure. And those are all really important things to look at and maybe some just rough rules of thumb. Yeah, if your grocery bagger or hairdresser is, you know, flipping five homes a year, might be a sign that the market's overheated. And also another good point you bring up, going to those RIA meetings, if these sophisticated investors that have large portfolios are selling everything they own, it's a pretty good indication that at least those people who are probably much more experienced than you see it as being at the top of the market. So yeah, just some really good things to look around and be able to gauge what people People are doing and seeing in the marketplace. Also, if you look at your local MLS supply, if supply is going up, days on markets going up, and the ratio of sold price versus list price is going down, those three metrics will tell you there's a problem in your market. And I'm seeing that now. I'm seeing the stuff selling for less than what it was listed for. I'm seeing the stuff sitting on the market longer, and I'm seeing supply go up. Three key metrics in a local market to tell you the market's shifting. And I'm sure you get this a lot too, Lee, but I often hear people say, well, I think the market's still going up. We're not at the bottom. I'm going to sit out and wait. I'm not going to get in the market right now. Good approach or bad approach? Fantastic approach. One of the smartest guys I know. I'll tell you exactly. I'm glad you literally batted me up for this quote. Good. There you go. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. We didn't even talk about this before. His biggest advice to me is said, Lee, you don't need to call the bottom of the market, but you have to call the top. It's not important to call the bottom. It's important to call the top. Let's think about that. When the market's in trouble, it's going to stay at the bottom for two, three, four years like it did last time. Even like a stock or real estate, when it turns, it starts to tank pretty quickly. And then you've got to start heavily discounting assets, which means... Sitting on the sidelines, you don't have that risk. So at the top of the market, you go from being an investor at the bottom to being a speculator at the top. So not being a speculator and sitting on the sidelines is not a bad place to be. It could actually save if you're really scaling this up. Case in point with me, if I had sat on the sidelines for two years, I'd be two, $3 million better off today. Yeah, definitely so. Well, I think something you do, Lee, is you're looking at hard numbers and actual metrics. Of course, yeah, you've got these subjective approaches, like if your grocery bagger is investing in real estate, right? But aside from that, Yeah, on that point, though, I'm trying to build a picture. I'm not hanging my hat. You know, people say, well, I see the inverse yield curve on the treasury note. Like, that's cool. Like, (laughs) I know you Google that and you're going to hang your entire career on that one statistic. But guess what? We got to build a picture. Every market's different. Every sub market within a market's different. In fact, in Tampa, I could have my regular three, two block in a regular neighborhood be stale. But in the historic neighborhood down the street, things are on fire. And so it's not when people make these generalities that the sky is falling down. That's just not a correct statement. I'm seeing this market cycle that it's very efficient. The stuff that should go for top dollar is going for top dollar. Standardized product is kind of stale. Stuff that's not in a great neighborhood is not going for top dollar. It's not in a great market. I mean, you look at more depressed markets like Gary, Indiana. Stuff's still going for five and 10 grand because that's a fairly depressed market. We're talking an entire real estate cycle where in Tampa, stuff has gone up two and 300%. And in Gary, Indiana, it's gone up 0%. So I see a very efficient market this cycle, which means that in the primary markets where the hedge funds are buying, the landlords are buying, the flippers are buying, those markets have shot up and are probably at the end of their cycle. But markets that are more depressed for a reason, by the way, there's not big tenant demand. There's no chance of appreciation. The asset beat up. I mean, there's lots of reasons why it's not going up in value. But however, if we look at a general picture beyond just those primary markets, as far as the demand goes, rates are going up and prices are going up. So all of that put together, that tells me in primary markets, there does need to be a correction in most primary markets. 
Yeah, I love it. Well, Lee, you've been investing for quite some time now in both depressed and high markets. So what are some of the things you've done to be successful in both types of those environments? Any kind of systems or processes or philosophies you've got in your own personal business? Yeah, systems, workflows. So really, I look at the software and those are, you got to really make sure you're using the right softwares to organize your information. What's next to that is you got to have really good workflows. You can have the best software in the world. In fact, let's take something like Podio, which a lot of people use for seller direct. You can have user A or business owner A and business owner B. One's wildly successful using Podio and one's not successful. Why? It's down to your SOPs and how you use the software. So you got to have the right software, the right technology. You got to couple with the right systems and the right workflows. And you got to have great people. In fact, I can be the best. I can have the best SOPs in Podio. But if I've got someone who doesn't know what they're doing, pushing the buttons in that, I'm going to have garbage in and garbage out. I'm not going to be able to use the software. So really having the right tools, the right workflow, and the right people, you have to have all three if you want to scale up a business. And that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, you can do five or 10 houses a year with no real systems and flying by the seat of your pants and coming and going whenever you want and kind of working here and there. But if you want to consistently bring in assets on a daily basis and process them through a production line, you have to have all three of those. It's just not negotiable. And by SOP, you mean standard operating procedure. Standard operating procedures, which means we do this, then this, then this. We fill in this data field, and then we fill in this data field, and then we click this button, we click this button, and then it goes over to this department. And so a lot of what I do is moving stuff through my different departments and out the door. We set it up like a McDonald's. We set it up like production line. You know, one guy grabs, one girl grabs a burger, they hand over the next guy, you kind of see a slide down the production line, exactly how my business is set up. Well, let's talk about maybe some of those systems and the processes you've got. So what are some systems and processes you've got for just creating long-term wealth that's, you know, weathered through all kinds of different markets? Sure. Well, I think that having a strategic approach is the, is the first thing that separates me from a lot of investors. I have a very numbers-based approach to what we're doing. And so I'm always looking at the numbers. If the numbers don't make sense, I don't go off a feeling, I go off the numbers. And so I'm looking at today's market and I'm looking at tomorrow's market. When I look at my job as a CEO, my job is to bring in money today. My second job is to look at tomorrow's money, which is the strategic direction for my company. But my third goal is dealing with major problems. So my day is totally defined by today's money, tomorrow's money, and major problem solving. That's all I do. Beyond that, I've set up a business that makes sense. It's, it's actually a business with departments. I've got pre-acquisition, acquisition. I've got a construction department. I've got a marketing department. And I've got a processing department, which is two transaction cor- uh, closing coordinators. And I have an accounting department. It's very defined roles. So that department gets used to processing a lot of assets, get really good at what they're doing, and they stay in their lane. And so I now have experts in closing, experts in accounting, experts in processing, experts in disposition. Everybody's an expert because if you look at my team now, nine out of 10 people in this company have processed thousands of assets in their department. And that's hard to beat. At this point, I truly have an expert of what they do. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, when you're dealing with the quantities of transactions and properties, you are lean, you have to have these very rigorous, well-defined processes. And it's like just this whole big, well-oiled machine you've built. So yeah, Yeah, it's built off reporting. You talk about what makes success. At this point, the reports have pushed to me and then I'm looking for problems. I'm not doing the work though. I'm no longer the doer. I'm the reviewer. I spent my day reviewing reports to look for problems. Yeah, I love that. Well, Lee, what other kind of parting piece of advice would you have for somebody who's looking to grow and scale their portfolio in a safe and secure manner and not have to worry about whether their property is going to be performing well tomorrow or the next day or in the next down cycle or up cycle? Sure. I would say that not over leveraging yourself, whether you're a flipper or whether you're a landlord, that's probably the one of the biggest piece of advice. And then coupled with that, which might almost sound like the complete opposite, is that one of the actually my most successful mentor who's a nine figure guy, he said leverage is the key to wealth. And so one of his lines of credit, just to give you an example, is a $200 million line with Deutsche. So that's his personal line of credit, just FYI. So leverage is the key to wealth. But coupled with that, my advice to everybody out there is do not over leverage yourself. And that applies to every aspect of real estate. If you have over leveraged yourself, you've no way out. That's what buries most real estate investors. They get too much debt. They're over leveraged. They've got nowhere to go. And the the ship sinks. 
Yeah, I love it. Well, it's been a lot of quick hitting advice here, Lee. Lots of good content. It's kind of good to just see somebody who's out there doing large volumes of transactions and in their opinion, like yours on the real estate markets and just seeing these market trends and kind of building a portfolio that will weather and not be reactive to down cycles, up cycles, et cetera. So really good stuff there. Now we wrap up all of our episodes with guests with our famous lightning round, just a series of questions we'd like to fire at you. You wrote for them? Ready. All right. Awesome. Well, the first question we've got for you is what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And then what did you do to overcome that? Uh, raising money. I made uh, raising capital a part of what I did. And I should have mentioned that part of today's income and tomorrow's income is raising capital. So I probably need to change the way I articulate that. But yes, one of my biggest challenges with money. So I focused on constantly raising new money. Yeah. Love that. Well, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? Yeah, setting myself up for success. And that goes into one of the questions you're probably going to ask me in a moment about my favorite book, which is Tools of the Titans. And the reason I say that, if you look at most successful CEOs, they got a morning routine. Why? A morning routine sets up your day for success. And planning an organization is the key to having a great day and you taking control of your day. Otherwise, you get out of bed last minute, you stumble into work, or you start to answer your emails, you have no plan, you're not mentally prepared for the battle, and you get your butt kicked. So, a big part of my success is starting my day early and setting myself up for success with a morning routine that does that. Yeah, I synonymate that with kind of like being a pinball and being reactive. If you just wake up and start your day on yeah. somebody else's terms, you're just getting paddled back and forth. And you know, wherever the world or your day takes you, if you get up, take on the day on your own terms, it just changes the whole day for you. So yeah, I love that. I've been practicing. It's a lot more enjoyable too, by the way. <laughs> yes, definitely. So awesome. Well, next question, like you alluded to, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? Tools of the Titans. It's a bunch of short stories, which is good for someone like me who's ADD. You can just read one section, get your nuggets and move on. You don't feel like you got this massive book to read. I really like the, the, the series of short stories. Yeah. Although it is a massive book in terms of size, that is Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss, podcast host, entrepreneur, super successful guy, really cool stories. And yeah, I love the content of that book, the structure that is, lots of little bite-sized segments and stuff. And I skipped around, by the way, looking at my favorite people. So I didn't actually read a cover to cover. I kind of skipped through and started with the ones I was most interested in learning about. Yeah, awesome. Well, Lee, do you have an online resource you find valuable in your day-to-day? Google Suite is what I'd recommend to everybody out there. It's the cheapest tool. And between Google Sheets, Google Tasks, Google Calendar, Gmail, by the way, the, the only exception to that is I find it's easier to process my email with Outlook. But everything else, as far as online spreadsheets, collaboration, we do all of that with Google and it's cheap. There's a free version of it. And then the one we do, I think we pay five or 10 bucks per account, but it's still dirt cheap compared to anything else out there. You can link all your sheets together. People don't realize you can set up a database where sheet A feeds, feeds off sheet B, sheet B and C. And you can actually create an entire database out of Google. It's a very, very powerful tool. And the fact that you can integrate tasks, you can slide your email right over onto a task and that way you're not having to type stuff out. I found it to be pretty seamless and they're constantly innovating it. Just like Zillow, for instance, Zillow is another tool that actually you can run your comps just like an MLS now with Zillow because their data is syndicated so regularly. It's pretty close to having MLS access. It's, it's a really cool tool. Yeah, love it. Google Suites and of course, Zillow. If you haven't heard of those, then I don't know what you're doing. So Lee, last question in our lightning round. If you were to give advice to your 20-year-old self to get started investing in real estate, what would that be? Put your foot down on the pedal when there's a huge opportunity. And when you see risk in the market, focus on risk reduction rather than just making money. Yeah, it's powerful and easy to glaze over there, but really important. I think you're so right there. So many people wish they would have just got started sooner, done bigger stuff, started bigger. Yeah, I just love that. Keep your pedal to the floor and just get after it. You know, people talk about 10X. My mentor told me when I saw, he saw an opportunity to buy notes back in 2008. He since then has bought tens of thousands of notes because that was where the opportunity was. But as soon as he saw that market change, he flipped to risk reduction and just unloaded all that stuff. And so I've really seen in someone at a very high level that's put pedal all the way down, pedal off, pedal all the way down instead of just cruising along because real estate, when there's a big opportunity, you need to gobble it up. But when there's risk in the market, you don't keep your foot down. you got to take a step back, go a different direction and not just be constantly going at one speed. 
Yeah, I love it. Lee, I know you have your company, Spin Properties, which is Southeast Property Investments Network, where you run all of your investment business and other things there. So tell us about what you're doing there and a little bit about where people can learn more about you, find you, connect with you. Yeah, we're over the next 12 to 24 months, we're looking at setting up an equity fund. And so that's a big focus of mine. This month, particularly, we're taking down over 200 assets nationwide in one package. So we're pretty, pretty busy this month with that. I'm also okay. working on a medical marijuana startup for the last five years and looks like we should be getting licensed in 2019. And as far as the educational platform, I teach real estate, flipyourincome.com. Again, that's flipyourincome.com. We teach newbies that have never done a deal, how to do your first deal. And I work with mid-level operators to teach them how to scale up their business with systems and processes and how to hire great people. I love it. So that's flipyourincome.com. And then of course, for more information, resources to find you, the best place to do that is at Spin Companies. Flipyourincome.com. Oh, at Flip Your Income. All right, great. Well, Lee, hey, thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun having you on the show, talking with yeah. you about your journey and all things real estate. Looking forward to having you back on in the next uh, few months, maybe talking market trends again. Sure, looking forward to it. All right, thanks so much, Lee. Take care. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. You bet. Bye. Bye. wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Lee Carney. I hope you're getting value from these shows. If you like what you've heard, please go over and leave a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening on. And hey, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to you. I hope you're having a great holiday season and I hope you're prepared for the new year and ready to take on new challenges. I hope to be there right along with you. So stay tuned. I think 2019 is going to be an exciting year for everyone. If you want to connect with me, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. You can do so at www.jacobayers.com or look me up on social media. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.